economy lead Brazil's 143 million voters to elect the world's first Green Party president? What would that mean for investors? And what would the first black leader mean for Brazil? Join CCTV for continuing coverage of Brazil's election 2014. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing our discussion about Israel's immigration policies when it comes to the thousands of African refugees in the country. Joining me is Mutasim Ali, an asylum seeker in Israel who currently lives at that detention center. Mutasim joins us from Tel Aviv. Also joining us from Tel Aviv is David Sheen, a journalist who's reported extensively on African refugees in Israel. We also have Bill Freilich, who's here from Human Rights Watch, which released a report this month on Israel's treatment of its African refugees. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Bill, let me start with you. Uh, what was the scope of this report, and how did you first become aware of the conditions under which these refugees were being held? Well, we actually, uh, interestingly enough, started doing a report on the treatment of Eritreans in the Sinai. And we're interviewing Eritreans in Egypt, and we interviewed some in Israel, and became really aware seriously of the problems that they were facing in Israel when we were interviewing people for yet a different report, and uh, saw the horrendous experiences that they had had coming through the Sinai, and then saw how badly they were treated in Israel on top of that. So we decided to issue a separate report on the conditions in Israel and continue to research that one as well. All right. I just want to get something out of the way here and give you the right of reply. The mm -hmm. Israeli Foreign Ministry spokesman said that Human Rights Watch has very little credibility, that you are often targeting Israel, and that you do this to raise money from countries like Saudi Arabia. Well, first, we take not a single penny from any government of any country on the, on the planet Earth. We don't take any government money at all. We take no UN money. Uh, the private money that funds Human Rights Watch uh, is carefully looked at to make sure that there's no influence peddling going on whatsoever. And if you look at the body of our work, we are critical of any country that violates human rights anywhere. Um, look at our web page, look at the, the, the history of the work that we do in the Middle East and throughout the rest of the world. So we stand by uh, the work that we do, and the criticism that is lodged uh, is one that we hear all the time. It's, it has no basis. Okay, let's go to Tel Aviv. Let's go to Mutassim. Mutassim, you're from Darfur. Tell us about your experience leaving Darfur and getting into Israel and trying to seek asylum there. Thank you very much. And um, as everybody knows that uh, Darfur is a region that's going through genocide until today. And that's one of the reasons I left Darfur. And um, I was studying university in Khartoum and I've been through um, um, different uh, difficult situations, I mean, tourist and arrest uh, during my, my school. And I had to flee my country, coming to Egypt. And the reason we couldn't stay in Egypt, just because of the uh, diplomatic um, uh, relationship between Sudanese government and Egyptian government, so that uh, they can easily deport me back to, 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 to Sudan. The only reason that I made it to Israel is just the lack of diplomatic and political relation between Sudan and, and Israel, and then also the, the, the the, the Jewish values that the only people that experienced genocide. And I know uh, in the history, in 2004, the only people that recognized what's going on in Darfur is genocide, uh, that genocide is only Jewish people. And that's one of the reasons I thought if I made it to Israel, they can provide me with the protection and I'll not be reported until things will be uh, changing my country and go back. Right, David, you reported extensively on this particular issue. Uh, you're writing a book on it. Uh, what is life like for refugees like Mutasim in Israel? Well, best to ask Mutasim, but I can say from the people that I've interviewed that there's a sense that people are being hounded, that they're between a rock and a hard place. In this country, they have essentially no rights. They've been allowed past the border, but they're not allowed to work. Without any right to work, you can't make any money to support yourself. So there's a very gray area there, people working under the table, therefore being exploited therefore also impoverished. So because people are forced to remain in poverty, it turns out that many of the asylum seekers from Africa end up living in impoverished neighborhoods, increasing the pressure on already dilapidated impoverished neighborhoods, and thereby ramping up tensions between uh, veteran Israelis and the newcomers. And it's a you know, pretty typical divide and conquer tactic, instead of the government dealing with its veteran Israeli population that's impoverished and raising their life conditions and allowing asylum seekers to do the same, the idea is pit one group 
against the other. And the way that it has done that, in addition to depriving asylum seekers of the right to work, is it's conducted an extensive incitement campaign so that in the public mind, asylum seekers are associated with terrorism, crime, anything that can be pinned on them to, to, to frame them as negative and worthy of deportation. Um, Bill, Israel says to the refugees, you can go back and we will in fact pay for you to go back, but if you remain here, you will remain in indefinite detention. Mm -hmm. That's not really a choice, is it? It's no choice at all. And uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees has said as much. Uh, and the High Court of Israel, in fact, has just said that as well. Um, that holding people in indefinite detention in the Negev desert uh, under the conditions that, that Israel has imposed on them, um, and to say that you have a choice between staying there indefinitely under those conditions or leaving um, is not voluntary return by any means. And essentially, they've done this simply because Israel is not able to deport these two nationalities, Sudanese and Eritreans. They can't deport them, so they're trying to force them to choose, quote unquote, a voluntary uh, uh, departure. Um, but there's nothing voluntary about it. And they do that by making life very difficult for them. They make it miserable. In fact, that's the actual words of our report is, um, is to make their lives miserable, lock them up and make their lives miserable. That was, those, those are the words of Eli Yishai, who was the former interior minister of Israel, that basically said that's the policy that we're going to follow. Um, make their lives miserable so they will choose to leave the country. Okay, let's go to Mutasim. Mutasim, uh, why are most people leaving countries like Sudan and Eritrea to go to Israel? Because, you know, on the one hand, we hear that people are seeking political asylum, they're seeking refugee status, but as we just heard from the Israeli government spokesman, he says most of the people are coming here because they want a better life. They're actually economic migrants, economic refugees. I mean, I mean, it's really very simple, you know, just to check the individual claims. I mean, uh, we have a very simple example myself. Um, the f when I got to Israel first, uh, I went to ask for an for, uh, asylum application form, and they told me for Sudanese, we do not have that form. Uh, we give that form for those who are vulner uh, vulnerable to deportation, for example, uh, Ivorians, I mean, from Ivory Coast and uh, Nigerians and Ghanaians. Uh, for Sudanese, you have a group protection. But, I mean, after I insisted, and, and, and I kept going to interior minister day after another, they gave me in 2012. Uh, think of it. I mean, after two years, uh, I succeeded to receive uh, RSD application form in 2012. Until today, there is no any decision about my case, and it's still calling me a migrant worker or an infiltrator. I think, I mean, that, that argument is baseless, and they cannot claim it anymore. And we have many Sudanese and Eritreans all over the world, and most of them are being recognized as refugees. I mean, the Faris, when they get to Europe or America, they do not ask them what is happening in your country. They ask them, they, they just want to make sure to verify their identity, if this, uh, uh, the uh, honesty came from Darfur or not. And um, I mean, uh, it's, um, it's strange for me that Israel keeps uh, saying that Sudanese and Eritreans are, are, are migrant workers without checking our individual claims. David, um, are there any indications on where Israeli public opinion stands on this? Um, it's quite unfortunate, but the government's incitement campaign has worked to a great degree. The last poll that I saw on this issue was in January, this past January, and you had a full 80 percent of the Jewish Israeli population uh, calling for African asylum seekers to be removed from Israeli population centers, 60 percent wanting them to be, or like between 60 and 80 percent saying they either should be kicked out of the country altogether or rounded into these camps. So full 80 percent wanting them out of population centers. Um, it's, it's the government has been playing on people's fears. For some people, it's strictly that they want a country that is not just ethnically Jewish but religiously Jewish and actually the presence of non-Jewish people is, is, is offensive to them. To others, it's playing on some fear, some base fear that, you know, follows, uh, you know, decades and, and centuries of, of anti-Jewish persecution, and now they've become afraid, paranoid, that if the percentage of Jewish people in the population ever falls below a certain point, then inevitably they will become a persecuted minority. So it's, it's the paranoia plus, on, on the other hand, supremacist views of some um, have 
coalesced into this cocktail of, of fear towards non-Jewish people. But, I mean, you, the state of Israel is in the middle of Arabia. It's in the northeast quadrant of Africa. So this is the, this is the region that you live in. It's unrealistic and, you know, un, un, immoral, frankly, to say that you want a society that's depleted of non-Jewish people, of Arab people, of African people, of, of others. So, but this is, these are the tropes that the government has been playing on. And, and clearly, um, after years and years, you know, of using these same uh, idea of creating a demographic threat, saying that a baby of a non-Jew is a demographic threat. It's taken hold, sadly, among the people. And, and this is the discourse that's widely accepted in the population, whereas in the United States or other places, there may be lots of racism. It's certainly a problem, and it needs to be tackled. But I would say that you'd probably find someone describing a uh, an immigrant baby as a demographic threat, I think that's beyond the pale of civilized discourse, where here mainstream politicians use this uh, language, this vocabulary, and there's no repercussions. They're considered, you know, that this is acceptable discourse here. Right, Bill. Uh, Israel is a signatory to a number of the conventions regarding refugees, regarding immigrants going into other countries. Can it, at this stage, face any kind of international sanction because of its policies? Well, the, the refugee convention is basically what's called self-executing. In other words, it's implemented through the national laws of the countries that have signed on to it and have bound themselves to it. So there is a certain deference given to countries to interpret their obligations under the convention. Um, the, um, and in this case, it is the principle of non-refoulement, the principle that you cannot force a person to return to, to their country of origin. And essentially, the high court in Israel has said that this is coercive, has said that this kind of indefinite detention is, um, is an affront to human dignity under the basic laws, which is the constitutional framework for Israel itself. So despite demagoguery, despite public opinion, the court has said the correct thing. And, and, to have, and to have placed this on the foundation of human dignity, which of course applies to all people regardless of their race, their nationality, whatever it may be. So in an instance like this now, where the High Court has ruled that that detention center is illegal, Israel has to shut it down or be in violation of its own law. Well, this is the second time the High Court has made exactly yeah. this ruling. I mean, they, they had a detention center, Sahronim, which is very close to the Halot uh, residence uh, center. Uh, and a year or so ago, um, the High Court ruled that this uh, indefinite detention of people at Sahar Anim was, um, again, against the, uh, the, the basic laws of Israel. So the government went around that and established the Holot Residency Center, saying that this is not really a detention center, it's a residency center, people can come and go. That what they, of course, did was set it up in the middle of the Negev Desert, 65 kilometers from Beersheba, the closest town, and made people sign in three times a day, head counts, um, and had a, a 10 p.m. curfew. And the court said, no, this is really detention on all but name. And, and so now we're back to square one. The government is already, we're hearing voices from the Knesset and from the government itself trying to figure out, okay, are there ways that we can get around this latest ruling? And I hope that this doesn't involve um, actually trying to change the basic law, the right. constitutional framework, on the fundamental question of human dignity, because that really is um, a foundation stone of, of law in the state of Israel, as it would be in, in, in other countries as well. And it's based on fundamental principles of human rights that apply to, to all human beings, regardless of their religion or their ethnicity or their background. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. David Sheen, Matassim Ali, and Bill Freilich with me in Washington. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to theheat at cctv-america.com. And to continue the conversation, join us on Facebook at CCTV America. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. From Wall Street to Beijing and every business center in between, we make sense of global finance by stripping away the numbers, 
and focusing on what matters to you the most. Biz Asia America, we've got you covered. an individual traveling from Liberia has been diagnosed with Ebola in the United States. The U.S. diagnoses its first case of Ebola, a man in Texas tests positive for the virus. 